Waguji Akasa, Waguji Fate. I'm here with Rabjot Mahek Singh. If you want to introduce yourself. Sasrikal, my name is Rabjot Mahek Singh. I am a filmmaker and art activist. Amazing. So uh, your portfolio is very diverse. It spans film direction, television production, installation art, art activism, so many different uh, forms of expression. Uh, can you share with us the journey that led you to pursue such a multifaceted and diverse career and how do you navigate the intersections and the interdisciplinary aspects uh, between these different forms of creative expression? I love that question. Thank you for asking that. Honestly, it started because um, I was always told to do just one thing and it never sat right with my soul. Uh, but I did that for a long time. I think I was like 24 or so uh, by the time that I had realized that it's actually weighing on me to not be exploring other things. Uh, growing up, I, I worked in the Bollywood film industry like when I was really young, mm -hmm. and over there they have this they have this like uh, way of like keeping women, especially like women creatives, down, and they're always saying, "Oh, girls can't do more than one thing. Pick one thing." So they told me I can either do fashion, I can either do music, or I can either do like film production. And even within like film production, no acting, no modeling, nothing, nothing in the intersections at all, actually. So just you know, I, I took that and I took that that stifling feeling that I was that I was always experiencing. And I was like, I don't wanna do that anymore. And I was like, why not? I have this one life I, and I, I don't wanna be like YOLO or anything like that. However, you know, I really do have this one time to explore art and creativity in my youth. And I wanted to do it in a way that I, I felt free. So I just went on this big liberation journey and it took a long time. It wasn't like an overnight thing. It was like a whole change of like perspective and, and thought process and, and all of that. And Honestly, now, to answer the second part of your question, it's not hard to merge all of these things together at all. Film encompasses so many things, whether it's set design, and that's like part of art installation, whether it's uh, costuming, so that's fashion, whether it's music and scoring and composition. So I actually think they go perfectly hand in hand. I think it's just people who make them seem very separate. That's amazing, being able to take those restrictions that someone's trying to place on you and purposely break them to kind of live true to yourself. I guess going off of that, if you have maybe a project or a topic in mind, do you kind of think, oh, between all these different things I can do, I wanna do one of these because I feel like doing that? Or do you think of the topic and the idea first and be like, what's the best medium I have at my disposal? Or maybe a medium that I haven't even interacted with before to get my idea and, and a kind of content across? Um, honestly, usually when I have a topic in mind, the vision is really clear. I feel like I'm a very rigid person when I think in the sense, so maybe my liberation journey isn't quite yet over, but usually I have a really clear thought of like, this story would be best told um, through the perspective of a film, like a documentary film. And it should be this long or it should be this type of series. So when I, when I come across these different stories, it's not that I'm like thinking, oh, what's the best way to communicate? For, for me, it's just like, it's a pretty clear vision. So like I knew, for example, for the art exhibit that I wanted to do, um, and that I did curate. I knew that I wanted to tell stories of the Sikh genocide specifically and our experiences um, after 9-11 and like how those kind of struggles are in parallel to each other. And that was very clear that this is not gonna be a film. I knew that from the very conception um, that this is gonna be like a collective art show and this is like the floor it's gonna take. Right, and would you ever consider, for example, with the project you were just talking about, kind of doing it in one medium and then adapting it in all these different mediums, like kind of having a main focus for it and having offshoots of like, oh, like we could film this connected to it or kind of create this uh, art curation piece and I did to it, like anything like that. Would, has that ever come to mind before? Yeah, I am so glad you asked because I have been filming um, this documentary called Off Guns of Boston. It follows the lives of these incredible refugees that were resettled in Boston uh, from Afghanistan when the United States withdrew. Uh, in 2021. And so I've been following them for a long time. I've been working pretty closely with their community for a long time. And it did start off as a documentary and it still is gonna be one. It's gonna be a feature length documentary. Um, but I've always seen like visions of it being a little bit larger and a little bit more interactive. Mm. So I have plans, for example, for that one to set it up as like an art installation as well in the Boston Common. Uh -huh. So that's like an example to me of something that would cross that Wow, that's so yeah. dynamic. I can Thanks. see what you mean by breaking the kind of rigid, uh, rigid like uh, restrictions. And 
uh, you know, here at Nishkov, we also can re uh, really respect that project because we uh, have worked on our own documentary on the Afghani Sikh and Hindus, Bay Watana, uh, that, uh, and so this is a topic near and dear to our entire team's heart. Um, speaking of other amazing topics, your curational debut show, uh, Bardafash, received critical acclaim for addressing the often censored struggles Sikhs faced in 1984 and onwards in India. Uh, can you elaborate on the inspiration behind the e exhibition and the impact you hope it has in raising awareness and fostering dialogue around these important historical issues? And specifically, like, if is there any unique uh, like impact it's having? Because um, obviously that is such a major part of our history. And even calling it history is weird because our parents' generation is the one that went through it. It is not a far removed thing. And so it is often a topic that, although we've censored ourselves, it's on our minds when it comes to forms of expression and art. And so what is unique about the impact you're trying to have with this specific project? And if you could talk about the inspiration behind it as well. Sure. Um, what I was honestly just inspired by my mother's story. She's a survivor of the 1984 Sikh genocide. She and her whole extended family uh, are from Delhi, and that's like one of the main cities that was targeted. Um, and they were all kept alive through different ways, but my mom specifically, a really kind Hindu neighbor, they're the ones who hid her whole family in their home for, for days, and they helped them escape um, like a few weeks later. And so I was really just touched by the fact that like, this is my mom that we're talking about, and this is a whole genocide that she's been through. It's, it's not a riot, it's not, you know, it's not, it wasn't just infighting. It was a little genocide, it was a targeted attack, and, and I don't think our people um, ingest that information Very enough, true. but I don't think we portray it that way. I think we've been quite brainwashed in that sense. There's a lot of propaganda around it, and that's actually why I chose to make it an art exhibit mm -hmm. rather than a film, because it's much harder to censor fine art than it is to censor a film. So all of the films, including the films that have been made in Bollywood, for example, or even documentaries that are made here, I actually have producer friends here in America that work for really big companies who are blacklisted and on the list of six that are being targeted for their work uncovering some of the history behind 1984. Uh, so that's why I was like, let's take it into a different direction where we're not actually using our words. We're using visuals to communicate the same story. Um, so that was kind of my inspiration behind that. I just wanted to make sure that she remembers her story because she's been having like she has PTSD in the sense that she's forgotten a lot of what's happened. So I actually went, um, you know, I went to different extended relatives and I got them to speak to me about what happened. I pieced together her story and then I kind of created a whole show around that. And I think in terms of like the impact that it's having, I think it's really cool because we haven't been censored yet at all. Wow. I'm pretty sure I'm not on like any blacklist or anything. So there, it's like a very liberating space to talk about it. If I had done it through film, I totally think I would have been off by now. Um, but I think it's having the impact of like every day, like even here where we're at right now at this event, one of the pieces is exhibiting. Um, people have come up to me and they're like, I also went through that. And you know, and they're not that much older than us. Like some of them are in their forties, you know, and they remember what happened. So I think it's creating like this unique open dialogue that I've never really, you know, I never expected it to have that. And I think it goes beyond film. That sense. I connected with that so much. My dad also grew up in Delhi and has a very similar story of uh, being saved by uh, some Hindu neighbors and having PTSD and not being able to piece together the whole story until recently. Um, and I really connected with that. And also just, you're right, there's so much we hear about in production circles and whatnot that people want to tell these stories. They get, they, they confront their trauma and want to be able to help other people confront their trauma. But there's so much censorship, not even just in India. And we're seeing this now with, with so many things happening in Canada and the UK and the US. And uh, I think it's using the way you're able to break bounds and bring things together to get past that censorship in still a very authentic way and being able to tell the full story, I think is very inspirational and something I really connected with. So I really commend you for that. Um, I wanted to ask you, I'm sure everyone today has been asking you, how has Sikhi, Sikh ethos, Sikh background inspired your work and how do you integrate it into your work? But I kind of want to flip the question a little bit and ask you, how do you think your work and what you've already put out there, what you're going to put out there is contributing to the general Sikh conscience uh, that we have and the general Sikh diaspora? So how are you pushing the Sikh conscience forward? And 
both and all in kind of like uh, pushing your personal growth, your artistic growth, and a general bunthic growth. If you could kind of think about how uh, how maybe you think you add and progress the bunt uh, yeah. in a brothers. I love this question because first off, I'll start it this way. I think the lens of a sick woman, especially like a progressive sick woman, is not often uh, pushed up as a certain other you know, demographics are. Uh, I also come from a very low caste, and I think it's really important for me to say that uh, because I think a lot of upper caste stories are the ones that are preserved, especially in media mm -hmm. and in mainstream media, of course, like everybody's always talking about Jack and this stuff. So for me, I'm already contributing just by existing as I am and not, you know, not uh, barring myself from my true identity, if that right. makes sense. I think it's important for people to hear an immigrant story where someone has actually struggled and doesn't have hereditary wealth to back them up. Right. Like it's a different, it's a different way of struggling when we come here. You know, and, and the way that my parents have struggled, like I think I am embodying that when I when I present it in my media, if that makes sense. And I also think that I work with a lot of, you know, marginalized communities that are outside of the Sikh, um, you know, Janta in general. Uh -huh. uh, I work with a lot of queer folks. I work with a lot of queer Sikhs as well. Okay. Um, I work with, you know, the Afghan community, the Latinx community. I work a lot with indigenous folks. And so I think when we put these stories together, it does progress Sikhi because Sikhi is to be an eternal learner. And I think a lot of people kind of keep it to themselves and, and, and choose not to continue learning forward. Right. So I think that's my contribution is, is not only my like lived experience as who I am, but also the, the you know collective consciousness that I bring to it through other people's stories. Right. So just to wrap it up, if you want to talk about anything you're working on right now, anything you have on the horizon, uh, so many different things you do. What, what can we expect next from you? Such a loaded question because I have it's coming. I have another speech in, in Washington DC coming up. Awesome. I'm super excited to be speaking there. Um, I also have a couple of films coming out this year. Oh. Yeah, including the Afghan one, okay. the Afghan doc. And I also have another one. It's called, uh, it's all about this incredible uh, drag. Uh, it's a professor. He teaches drag. He was the very first professor to teach drag as a course in America. And he's actually from Tufts University, so oh. it's like a it's like a local thing. A little homecoming. Yeah. yeah. So I'm really excited to release that work. I think everybody deserves to hear that story and and really see like the roots of drag and how it fits into academia and how it can actually help us all expand our worldview as well. So I'm super excited for that. Awesome. Thank you so much for giving us such insightful uh, look into the type of work you do, and uh, thank thank you for giving us your time. Why would you akasa? Why would you give Please subscribe, share, and like this video to support us.